about you.
thank you so much, Lord Jesus. As we just continue to worship you, Lord God. May we just exalt you, Lord God, in everything, Lord God, that we do. Father, you truly are worthy, Lord God, of all of our praise, Lord Jesus. You're worthy, Father. You are our hiding place, Lord God. Even when things around us seem to fall apart, Lord God, you're with us. And I thank you so much for that, Lord Jesus.
Matthew chapter 4. This morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4, though the, the context of this chapter is in 1 through 11, but we're going to break this up into two parts, A today and B next week. We'll look at the first temptation this morning. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Let me start with this. The test in life can be a barometer of our hearts. The things that we go through, the trials and the struggles, the heartaches, the financial difficulties in our relationships can be a barometer of our hearts. Where are our hearts? When we deal with those things, where's our heart in dealing with it? Do we get frustrated? Do we get angry? Or do we look at it as an opportunity to grow, to learn patience, to learn what maybe the Lord is teaching us as believers? It's a barometer of our heart sometimes and after jesus had been baptized by john the baptist here when we saw it a couple of weeks ago the spirit was then falling upon him as approval of the father as the father said this is my son whom i am well pleased in in a sense he is now going to be led by that spirit into the wilderness to be tested which i find interesting that the spirit would lead him that way we also receive the same Holy Spirit when we at first accepted Christ into our hearts. He also came into our hearts to lead us and to guide us, but also to empower us. As John the Baptist said about Jesus, he would give us a baptism of fire also, right? Speaking of the strength and the power and the purity in our lives. And we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us but also to empower us to live that life for him well when does that happen you might be asking yourself why is it that i don't have that power because it is a fresh anointing every day yes the holy spirit comes into us and fills us in the beginning but we have to ask for the holy spirit every day we should be asking every morning paul said in ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 be filled with the spirit and this is a command that means to be constantly or continually being filled. In other words, controlled and empowered with the Holy Spirit as a way of life, as a way of life. So Paul was saying here, be filled every morning, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you daily in the decisions that you need to make in life, in the battles in life, in the struggles in life. The Holy Spirit should be the one leading you. Now, we don't like that in America, to be led, because we feel that we have freedoms, and we are individuals, and we have the right to lead ourselves, we have the right to choose our paths, and so forth, and so it's difficult for us to realize that God has given us a person, the third person of the Trinity, to lead us in this life spiritually, and we have to submit to Him, we have to submit to Him, and that's the struggle that we have. That is why we don't have the power. That is why we don't always uh, have the success in our battles and in life because we're not submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit when He leads us. And we know that when we're in a battle that we need to fight against Him with the Word of God and we hear the Word of God in our minds because we've read the Word of God and we know we need to pick up that shield of faith. But what happens is, is the Spirit is telling us to pick up that shield of faith. We throw it down. No, no, I'm going to do this in my own way. And that shield of faith is laying there, and so that's why we have such a struggle in life. And so we really do need a fresh anointing every day. And if you already believe in Christ, then you are already indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And so ask God for that fresh filling every day. Now, the first place that Jesus was led out to was the wilderness, and he was led out to be tempted. Uh, temptation is a part of life while we live on this earth. We, we can't get around that. Uh, we don't like it, but it's there. And we will always have temptation. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. The devil is the same, just as yesterday, today, and he will be tomorrow, just as, as the Lord says about himself. So the devil has one plan, and that's to lift himself up in your life and to become your God. He wants to lead you. And so he will always bring battles against you so that you can deny the Lord and not trust in the Lord, and so you deny 
him completely and allowing yourself to rule and reign in your own life. And he has you right at that moment. And so there are life situations that bring about uh, these temptations. And often when we are blessed, we need to be aware that there are battles, these battles, and there are battles that are coming up. Whenever you get on a pinnacle, when you're on a high, remember you always have to come down. And there's always going to be those battles when you come down. Up to this point, Matthew has been revealing Jesus as the king, right? Matthew is revealing Jesus as the king. So remember that, as the king. And so in chapter 3, he announced him as that king. And then he acknowledged him as the king. And then he anointed him as the king by the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 4, we see the approval of the king because he goes through this test and he is victorious. Now, I've entitled this message this morning is The King Tempted. The king tempted. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 11. When Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and when he had 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now here's the second temptation. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now the third temptation. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. There's the context that we'll be looking at uh, these next couple of weeks. So look at verses 1 through 4 here in Matthew, which correlates with Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, and also Luke mentions it in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Now there are a couple of things that Mark mentions that aren't mentioned in Matthew. He talks about wild beasts being there during the time of this temptation. Now what these wild beasts were doing there, we don't know. But it does give us a a reference point to the Old Testament Uh, uh, in Genesis where Adam and Eve were tempted by the devil too. And they were in the garden and there were probably wild beasts. In fact, Satan came as a serpent, a wild beast there. Now whether these beasts were ministering to Jesus or whether these beasts were just acknowledging Jesus there, we don't really know. But Mark mentions that wild beasts were there. Luke says that being filled with the Holy Spirit or full of the Holy Spirit, not that Jesus needed to be filled because he was already God and he was three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and being one God. And so he, he had the Holy Spirit already, but being filled. In other words, acknowledging that he has the Spirit of God in him. And it says that he returned from the Jordan. So he gave a reference point of where Jesus was. And also that Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And then also he mentions that he departed from him until another opportunity came up. So he wasn't done. Satan's still uh, lurking behind the scenes, waiting for an opportunity to uh, harass Jesus, even all the way unto the cross and even to the resurrection. And even afterwards, and today, he's still on a rampage against us. We've got to be aware of our enemy. We really do. He's out there, and he hates you. He hates us. He hates the body of Christ, and he's doing as much as he can to divide the body of Christ. Spurgeon outlines these verses as the king faces his enemy. I like that. The king faces his enemy. I think it's interesting how Satan is consistent and how he tempts people. Just like Adam and Eve. Uh, You know the story of Job and how Satan was there in the heavenlies and he came to God and God said, hey, had you considered my servant Job? Again, which I find interesting. Here the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. Here's God telling Satan, hey, have you considered my, my servant Job? God's involved in our trials. God's involved in our testings, isn't he? Somehow. And I don't want to be in Job's place and God kind of showed 
me off, you know, to Satan and say, hey, my servant Job, I, I trust him. I know he'll be victorious over your temptations. Uh, try him. I don't want Satan's attacks. You know, Lord, please don't, don't, don't boast in me. You know, I don't need them. You know, I probably will fail, not like Job, who was so, so in love with the Lord. And the devil tempted uh, Adam and Eve, as we know that in Genesis chapter 3. Do you know what he tempted Eve with and Adam? Food, fame, and also power, just like he's going to tempt Jesus here with. Food, fame, and power, with the physical, with, with the, the lust of the flesh, with, with the fame, you know, wanting to be known. The Facebook, right? Everyone's a star now. Because you can go on Facebook, post your pictures, and get likes, and it's like you're on a magazine, and so everybody becomes famous uh, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and I'm I, I'm just learning Instagram. I don't know the Twitter, 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 Twitter. I get that wrong all the time, so I'll learn that later on. But but the fame again, same temptations, and then obviously the power, the power that's there, and you and I will be tempted in the like manner. You'll be tempted in the physical. You'll be tempted with wanting and desiring fame. I mean, this happens in the church. How come people don't know me? What about my ministry? Why am I not noticed? Uh, That's a struggle. That's why we don't want to be noticed. You you shouldn't be doing things to be noticed. Drawing attention to yourself. Uh, That's a no-no. That's fame. That's wanting the the notoriety, you know, the, the authority and so forth. And then also the power. The power will be tempted the same way. And you probably already know that. So Jesus is led up by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 1. He was led up by the Holy Spirit. Interesting here, the Greek actually says the Holy Spirit drives him or impels him into the wilderness. Almost like he had no choice and the Spirit was moving him that way. Uh, Sometimes we don't have choices in our testings, in our trials, right? We wonder, how did I get here? If it was my choice, I wouldn't be in this situation. And so the Spirit is leading him that way into the wilderness to be tempted or to be tested, in another way of saying it, by the devil, the slanderer. So Jesus just experienced the anointing of the Father, the Holy Spirit, at the baptism, and now immediately the devil comes in and he tests him, being led into the wilderness, where he alone, without anyone around, him and the Father having to deal with this conflict of testing. Often we find ourselves alone in conflicts. Uh, People don't understand what we're going through. At least we think they don't understand. Uh, Oftentimes people don't have the answers. They can't be there all the time. And so oftentimes we're alone. It's just us and the Lord. And we have to... battle this conflict alone with the Lord and to learn the lessons that he's teaching us. Jesus didn't seek to be tempted, but he was led by the Spirit to be tempted. Just like Job didn't seek to be tempted, the Lord was boasting in him. And you and I are to be led by the Spirit, uh, also to be tested in a sense. Romans 8.14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And so at least we know that, that if the Spirit is leading us, then we know we're also children of God. If you are fighting battles and temptations, I mean, I mean fighting them. I'm not, I'm not talking about if temptations are just there. If you're fighting against them, if you're battling against these temptations, that's good because that proves that you are a child of God and God is testing you. An example of this of the Spirit leading, we see that in Acts chapter 8, verse 39, where the Spirit was leading Philip to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And then when he led him in a certain ABC direction, and then he was able to minister to him, baptize him, and what happened? The Spirit just took him like that, and he was transported to another direction. So the Spirit leads us. And even in Elijah eighteen twelve, uh, I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you. And when I leave you, the Holy Spirit was guiding him, that is Elijah, and we see that his angels were helping him. And so the Spirit leading Elijah. And so the Spirit leads us and guides us in our lives. But the devil is there to tempt us. And the devil wants to tempt us. He takes every opportunity to tempt us so that we get discouraged, so that we lose heart. We want to give up in a sense. And so we wander off alone when we need to gather in the assembly and fellowship with one another, encouraging and strengthening one another, finding prayer 
and power in that manner. Peter said, beware, or he actually said, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he wants to devour. That's his nature. That's his whole nature. He, he doesn't change. Uh, just like that, that story of the frog and the uh, scorpion, right? They're on one side of the river and they need to get to the other side of the river. And so the scorpion comes up to the frog and says, hey, why don't you let me get on your back? And you just take us across the river. And the frog looks at him and says, well, you'll, you'll sting me. Why should I let you get on my back? He goes, no, no, I promise I won't sting you. He says, you won't sting me. No, 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 I promise I won't sting you. He says, okay, get on my back. So the scorpion's on the back of the frogs and they're swimming across the river. Three quarters of the way there, all of a sudden he feels something. And he looks back, he goes, and the scorpion stung him in the butt. And the guy, frog says, I thought you weren't going to sting me. He goes, it's in my nature. It's in my nature. You can't change it. And that's Satan, right? He's going to sting you. It's in his nature. Uh, he, he knows nothing else but to destroy and to conquer. And so for you to give yourself into him uh, means that he's just going to bring you completely down to destruction. In Job 1.6, we saw that he was in heaven walking to and fro with the Lord. And the Lord again um, said, what about my servant Job? Have you considered him? And so the enemy is there to destroy and to kill. He will even bring thoughts into our minds and try to control us in that manner. Luke twenty-two thirty-one. When Peter began to rebuke Jesus and Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. That's a scary thought. Here's Job in heaven, God asked him, I'm sorry, uh, Satan in heaven, and God asked Satan about Job, and now Satan's asking God about Peter. Hey, Lord, can I sift Peter like wheat? Wow, that's a scary thought. But he wants to destroy us. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil a foothold. And so that's why we need to battle him. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to put on the full armor of God that we can fight against the... The, the attacks of the evil one or the wicked one. Why would the Spirit lead Jesus into this temptation? I, I don't fully understand that, but we know that there's a test in his life for us so that we may know that he is our high priest. And he's been tempted in every way, just as we will be tempted in every way. And so we can go to Jesus Christ, and we're not alone in these temptations because we do have someone that's been tested in, in the food, the fame, and the power. And he understands our infirmities and our failures. Now, he passed. We don't pass, unfortunately. We don't always pass uh, the physical and the lust of the flesh. We don't always pass the fame and the, and the power and so forth, but he has. And so we can go to him and, and ask and find forgiveness and grace in those times of needs. We can know that he understands our infirmities. Let's go to verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. So 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus fasted, just like Moses fasted. You remember he was fasting for 40 days there in Mount Sinai before he received the Ten Commandments. Elijah also fasted 40 days on the way to the same mountain. And so we have a picture here of Moses who received the Ten Commandments, the law. Elijah, who was a prophet of God, fasting 40 days and 40 nights before the Lord, and now the Messiah, Jesus who is the Messiah of the law and of the prophets fasting, pointing to him. In chapter 6, we're going to take a look a little closer at this fasting. I'm not going to spend time this morning on it. Uh, fasting is an interesting subject. It's one that we don't talk a lot about, but we'll see that in chapter 6, that it does teach us that, that, that we are to be people that are in control of ourselves self-controlled you know that we're able to resist temptations we're able to resist certain things uh, because again we have the holy spirit in us and he empowers us to do so so it says that he was hungry afterwards and that makes sense right 40 days of not eating yeah you're gonna get a little hungry uh, after that and and so he was hungry i get hungry just after a couple of hours my stomach starts to growl and I start to smell the food that comes from the kitchen here that's getting prepared so that we can have something to eat in between services. And you start going, I'm getting a little hungry here. Imagine 40 days and 40 nights without food. 
your body goes through a whole process there of starvation and then death. They basically say that you get hungry for the first two or three days and then you stop getting hungry. Then by the 40th day or 39th or 38th, all of a sudden your body starts getting hungry again. And what your body is saying is, I'm dying. And if you don't feed me by this point, I'm dead. I am literally dead. And so Jesus is hungry saying, I need to eat something here. And that's where the devil takes advantage of us. At that point, at our weaknesses, when we're struggling, he comes in and he attacks us. If it's finances and we're struggling with paying the bills, and usually it's because we're not budgeting correctly, and we're spending on luxury items, things that we shouldn't be spending them, and now we're in a financial crisis to pay our needs, then our necessities and so forth, and our wants, and now we're crying out. And that's when the enemy comes in and says, aha, I've got you. And he takes our weaknesses, and he tries to destroy us at those points. So Jesus fasts 40 days and 40 nights. And yet the crucifixion is coming soon. So let's look at the first test of Christ in verse 3 through 4. I'm going to touch a couple of things that we see here that are, I think are important for us to understand. <clears throat> it says, now, the, now when the tempter came to him, that is Jesus, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, let me stop there for a second. Again, like Luke said that Jesus was being filled with the Holy Spirit. Not true. It was, uh, Luke was saying he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. That he's already filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, what, what Satan is saying, the tempter is coming to him and he said, if you are the Son of God, in the Greek, uh, because the order of it, Son is the important uh, part of this whole phrase. If you are the Son of God. And it's the emphatic in the Greek. In other words, the emphasis is on the Son. If you are the Son of that's your position, that's your place, that's your authority. You are the Son of God. The word if in the Greek literally is since you are the Son of God. So it's not questioning His Sonhood, it's acknowledging His Sonhood, and acknowledging His, son, his Sonhood with power and authority, you can do something about this, is what He's saying in this moment. So turn these stones into bread and feed yourself. Misuse your authority misuse your position in your place that's the context that's taking place here now let's pull some things out of this we know that the tempter here is satan himself now whether he's visibly present or not it doesn't say Uh, some argue the point that that this may have been happening in jesus's mind it doesn't say that it could be that he was present and jesus was literally talking to him back and forth it doesn't say that um, we know back in Genesis <clears throat> that, the, that Satan himself uh, uh, was visible to Eve, so there's not a problem with him being visible to human beings. And so it could be that, that Satan was literally visible here uh, to, to Jesus himself. But we know, as we read earlier, that, that he's out like a roaring lion and he wants to devour Jesus. And Satan tries to get you to question God's provisions. And that's what he's doing here. He's questioning whether God can supply what Jesus needs. And Jesus has the authority to give so, but, but he's questioning it. He's questioning the importance of provisions. He's questioning being an important person. He's questioning his worth or his power. So again, food, fame, and power. Satan told Eve in the garden that God was a liar. He got Job's wife to question God. And that's his plan. He tries to get Jesus here to question God's provisions, to lust over the flesh, to fulfill it, uh, having that desire and that temptation and use that power and authority to fulfill that lust and that desire. What is Satan bringing to your mind to question? Is he causing you to question God? Do you question God's ability to provide for you? Do you question God that he's able to take care of you, to watch over you? Uh, we do all the time. Don't we fail in that area? Where's my next meal coming from? We don't have clothes to buy. We don't have these things in our lives. What's going on? Don't believe it. 
God is in total control, and he has all things in the palm of his hand. There's nothing he can't do, nothing that he cannot take care of. And, and people will express or, or give into their demons when they can no longer cope. And so they give up because they realize, I have no control. I can't handle this. And that's where you need to let God handle it and not let the enemy handle it because he does come in at those weak points and he wants to take control. And so at that weak point in Jesus' life, while he's hungry and he's ready to die from starvation, he says, command these stones to be turned into bread. Look at verse 3 again. And when the tempter came to him, he said, you are the son of God. And he's alluring to what the father said earlier at the baptism. This is my beloved son. And so he's challenging Jesus to exercise his power as the son of God, to appease his hunger. And so provide to himself and all that he really is what the father calls him, my son. So since you are the son, use your power and authority to turn these stones into bread. Use your position as the Son of God. And with one word, you could just speak it forth. And the word bread there is cakes or loaves. You can turn these stones into cakes and feed yourself. You know, people work hard. <clears throat> I don't deny that at all. Uh, they're hard workers. Uh, all of you are hard workers. All of you that I know here and people that serve here, you're hard workers and you work very hard. And you work very hard to provide for your families, you know, the provisions that they need to have a roof over their head, a vehicle so you can get back to work and so forth. These are provisions. These are food, the food that's put on the table, the clothes that are on their, their backs, right? I mean, you work hard for all that stuff. Maybe you don't. I don't know where you, do, where you work at or what you do, but I think you do. And I think all of us do because we want those basic needs met. Now, this is a touchy subject because I'm going to talk a little bit about provisions, uh, why we work and what we should be really doing and not misusing what God has given to us. Let me say it like this. Work does not come before God. God's should be first. Well, wait a minute. I've heard it said that it's God, family, and then church. That's the order I've heard it said from the pulpits many and many a times, okay? I don't disagree with that, I, but I also have a different opinion on that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to talk about that at this moment. So, so we understand there's an order, but does work come before God? But wait a minute, though. I have to work to provide for my family, don't I? Well, yes, you do. And the Bible's clear that if we don't work, we're, we're worse than an unbeliever, right? So, so we do need to work. And people are also working hard, 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 though, to purchase their toys and their joys, right? Because it's not always just the necessities. If we were to stop and really think about it, let, let me just work for my necessities, to put a roof over my head, to put food on the table, to put clothes on my children's back, to take care of our household, the grounds, and pay our utilities and so forth, just the necessities, to be able to support the church and, and give to the church. Those are necessities. I think that you would stop working a lot of hours. But what happens is, is we start working for the toys and the joys. And so now I have to work for my quads. I have to work for my motorcycles. I have to work for my vacation house in Big Bear that I never use, maybe once a year. And then now I realize I'm not even doing that anymore. Or my beach house or my vacations and things like that. And so now we're working for the toys and joys. Now there's nothing wrong with that because God is such a gracious and loving God. He's even given us those things. But when it comes before God, that's when we've failed the test that God has given to us. You could, ha you could say the toys and joys should not come before God. They shouldn't come before God. They should be second. I, I remember a family that used to come here and the reason they came to church, this was years ago, was because the kids were bringing them to church. They heard about Jesus. They went to our class. They liked what they were hearing. And, and many of the kids get saved in the class there because Virginia always preaches the gospel, always gives them an opportunity to ask Jesus. And so I think they got saved and they wanted to be at church on Sundays. But because of the sports, the toys and the joys of life and why the parents were working so hard to make sure their kids all were involved in sports. So sports got in the way. So 
they would miss pretty much every Sunday for a certain season, and all of a sudden you see them again. Where have you been? Oh, the kids were in soccer. Oh, the kids were in football. Oh, the kids were in baseball. You know, and oh, it's been in between the sports, and so we're here because the kids keep telling us to come back. And they are missing the whole thing. Not only are they missing the whole thing, but what are they showing their children? What is important? What do they prioritize in their lives? And that's what's worse than anything else, the misleading of our children and how we're raising them up to be because they're watching us. And if we're making other things a priority, the joys and the toys, and not church, not the fellowship and the assembling of one another, not the work of God, then when they grow up, that stuff has no meaning or value at all. And we really need to think about that. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians, I'm going to give you some scriptures here. Second Thessalonians 3, 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with, with labor and toil night and day, that we might be or not be a burden to any of you. Now this is the Apostle Paul saying that there's nothing wrong with working. We work too, uh, to provide for ourselves, just our basic needs. We won't take your bread because you work hard too. And so we're going to feed ourselves so that we don't become a burden to you. Then he goes on and says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So working is good, and if you don't work, you don't eat. And there are people that are lazy, unfortunately. They don't want to work at all, but they're not in church either. And nor do they want to serve in the church either. So working is not the problem. It's when we begin to give the luxuries and the joys of life the priority and it pulls us away from god we failed the test of satan if jesus had did this then it would have proven that jesus wasn't the son of god he had the authority to turn stones into bread he could have provided for himself he could have taken his own power and strength and he could have said yeah i'll do that and then i can eat but he didn't do that because he was the son of god he had to pass this test a true son will not doubt his father and tr try to provide his own bread. There's another concept that we need to understand as Christians. We think that we provide our bread for us. We don't. Uh, you know, we just have seen a crash in the economy where people were being laid off. I'm talking lawyers and doctors. I'm talking professional people. I'm talking educated people. They had no choice. The company said, I'm downsizing. I don't care how much education you have. I don't know how much um, experience you have. Sorry, we can't use you anymore. Now they're going to McDonald's and working. Are they in control of their life? They think they're in control because they're with a big corporation and they're paying their bills and thinking, wow, I've got myself here. That corporation doesn't care. If they have to downsize, you're gone. You're gone. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God providing for us. And that's a concept a truth, a principle that God has established in His Word that we miss. And we need to focus on God and not on our abilities and, and our employers, in a sense. It's God that provides for us. And Jesus understood that. I don't need to do anything. God will provide for me in His timing, in His way. I don't have to work at it. I don't have to push myself. This was a struggle at work for me. I, I was you know, working for Southern California Edison making over $100,000 a year. I worked, they called me the, the overtime guy. I mean, I would work every overtime that they had, sometimes working, you know, three days in a row. Someone was just mentioning that. I just worked three days in a row. Yeah, I've done that straight through. And then you have to take an eight-hour break, and you're back on the clock again another three days. That's how they get around it. So I was pulling a check on a two-week check. I could pull eight to $10,000 on a two-week check. But while I was doing that, I was also serving the Lord. I was teaching Wednesdays. I was teaching Sundays. I was teaching men's studies. I was teaching the men's breakfast. I was here cleaning at that time the church and preparing it and doing all that stuff. It's priorities. It's priorities. God isn't saying don't make the money. He's saying prioritize. Make me first and I will provide for you because what that has done, bless you, <laughs> what that has done, what that had did for me 
was it freed me up to pay all of my debts so that I could prepare myself to get into the ministry. That was the whole purpose. So when I went out, I bought a car. I paid it off. <laughs> I just bought the car. and said, okay, now I've got a car for 15 years. In fact, we bought two cars. And then we bought uh, appliances, and we figured it was going to last for 15 years. And, and we set ourselves up to quit. And then I quit and went to, at the time, I think it was like $25,000 a year. But I was able to meet my needs. I had a roof over my head. It was a nice roof because I bought it while I was working with Edison. But my house payment is ridiculously low. I can't get anything out there to rent like that. I have cars in my, well, now I have only one car. <laughs> I have one car in my, my name now. I've got no bills. I pay for my utilities, I, you know, just to, you know, the normal stuff. And God has been so gracious enough that I can go to Starbucks every day. You know, that I can do something once in a while. I can go out and, and eat and so forth. But it's all about priorities. Priorities. Are you a generous person? Are you a generous person? You don't even know what that means. Are you a giving person? When you see someone who has a need, do you think about, oh, can I meet that need? Can, can I, ha you know, help him out? You know, you're in the store and you see someone, they're like, oh... 50 cents more, uh, and you know, they're like going like this, and, and you're just standing there. Come on, hurry up. You got 50 cents somewhere, you know. Have you ever thought just pulling out, a, hey, here, what? See, that's a generous person. He has a generous heart, and he's always looking for those opportunities to give. You know, we were sitting at breakfast the other day at Corky's, me, Randy, and uh, was it Carlos? No, someone else. Oh, Fred. And we, they had uh, uh, done some work around the church, so we went to breakfast, and, and we're talking about the Lord and just, you know, just fellowshipping and stuff. And all of a sudden, it comes to the bill, and someone said, oh, it's, it's paid for. I'm like, what? Someone paid for it. That's a generous person that looks for opportunities uh, to meet. You know, do you give to the church? When, when you hear there's a need, you know, and you go, well, how can I meet that need? How, how can I be a part of that? How can I be generous? Do you have a giving heart? at all or is it always me 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 i got bills i got things to do i got things to take care of i got my own stuff i can't worry about other people see that's not a generous heart we need to have generous hearts acts twenty thirty five. remember the words of the lord that he said it is more blessed to receive than to give no it's not what he said it's more blessed to give than to receive the word blessed there is happy those are happy people that are generous people. The people that aren't happy are the ones that take all their pennies and they hide them away. No, 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 that's my penny, that's my penny. And then all they're doing is worrying about all that. Let me give you some scriptures about generosity and the foolishness of riches. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and snares into many foolish and harmful lusts and drown men in destruction and perdition. First Timothy 6.9 Wow, that's the riches. When we're seeking riches, and that's all we're seeking, again, priority, priority. When that's all we're seeking, this family, unfortunately, never came back to church. But they're all great soccer players and baseball players. They're children of perdition. Was it worth it? I don't think it's worth it. First Timothy six seventeen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, because with riches comes pride. Nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Trust in who? The living God. Who gives us all richly, all things to enjoy. Priorities. First Timothy 6.18 Let them do good, that they be rich in good works. Ready to give. Willing to share. Generous. You have the riches to share with others when there's needs. James 5.1 Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Uh, because you're hoarding it, and you're storing it, and you're hoping to use it at a later time, you know, miseries are coming, because you're not a generous person. And don't pretend to be poor. I know we live in a poor area here, right? And it's like, well, I'm just poor. I, you don't understand. I don't have the resources. Yeah, but I see you at Starbucks every day. You know, I see you driving a brand new car. Wait a minute, how poor are you? <laughs> no, look, that's not an excuse to not be generous. It's not an excuse for the Lord at all. 
Jesus was sitting with the disciples in Luke chapter 21, and there came a woman. And if you want to talk about poor, she had two mites, and she thought she was rich because she gave both mites to the Lord. That's how rich she thought she was, and she was right because the Lord provided for her those two mites, and she gave them to the Lord. So that's poor. She had no car. She had no house. She was a widow, lost her husband. She had nothing but two mites to her name. And Jesus said, Pfft. she gave more than all of the Pharisees and Sadducees who gave of their wealth and their toys and joys. My mom's a great example of this. My mom has always been such a generous person. She's always been that way. I've, I've seen her literally wrapping gifts up for the mailman because she just has a generous, they deliver my mail every day. And they're so faithful, I need to give them a Christmas gift, you know? Mom, who gives mailmen Christmas gifts? You know, that's crazy. Uh, she'll pay for people while she's out there, you know, in the store. If she sees someone struggling, don't have a nickel, she'll literally say, here, it's mine. You take her out to lunch or dinner, she's going to demand that she pay for it because that's just her heart. And she's not wealthy. The Lord has provided for her. But that's her heart, and I've seen that throughout the years. I want you to read Proverbs 3, 5 through 10, though. And get the context that this is your homework for the day. Yes, we give homeworks once in a while. <laughs> but we, we know what 3 5 says, right? Uh, Proverbs 3 5 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understandings, but acknowledge his ways, and he'll direct your path. And we like always use that scripture when we're going through battles and struggles, right? And things that are unknown. And so just trust in the Lord. But when you read it in context, he's really talking about generosity. He's saying, Make sure you give your first to the Lord. And just trust in Him. He'll provide for you. He'll fill your houses and your vats full. That's the context of that scripture. Read it. He wants us to be generous people and He wants us to trust in Him for those provisions. I really believe that the more you give, the more He gives you because He knows you're faithful with it to give it out. And so your needs are always provided. This is how God provides for His children. Command these stones to turn into bread. Notice that the enemy will test you on your circumstances. He tested Jesus with the bread, knowing he was hungry. So just guard your weak points. Now verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Quoting Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. Now I want to read it because there's something interesting here. So Jesus is saying, look, we're not to live on bread alone. We're to live on the word of God. We're to trust in our God that he will provide for us because that's what the word of God says, that he is our provider. He's our sustainer. And so we trust in him because the word of God is said to trust in him. And so I'm living on the word of God because it is written, Satan. And I'm not going to go after my feelings or my logic or my wisdom I'm going to follow what the Word of God says. And so he quotes Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. This is what he says. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Now he's talking to the children of Israel, and they're going to the promised land, and so God's giving them some instructions to go in there. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all this way for 40 years in the wilderness. Who was leading them? The Lord was leading him. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the temptation. The, the, the Lord told, Job about, uh, told Satan about Job. The Lord leads us. He says, so all these years I've been leading you in the wilderness. But this is why. To humble you and test you. To know what is in your heart. Whether you will keep my commandments or not. These testings that come our way are for you to know your own heart. Have you passed or have you failed? Are you a generous person or do you just provide for yourself the bread? Or do you really trust that it is God who provides for you? In, in the Hebrew when he says whether you will keep his commandments or not, this has not changed. God is still leading his people and testing them so that they will know what's in their hearts. It's still the same today. He wants you to know what's in your heart. 
And then he wants you to make the appropriate changes to your heart that you may become what he wants you to be. And he goes on and says, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And that's the context that Jesus is quoting from. He's going back to the Old Testament. He's quoting from Deuteronomy and telling Satan, look, my father led the people of Israel in the wilderness and he provided for them at his time. Now they failed and their hearts were revealed to them and they knew that they didn't pass. But here I stand as a representative of one will not fail and I will trust in the Lord. Man shall not live by, every, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So as in a sense, Jesus pulls his sword out and he just fights with the word of God against the enemy. Like David said, thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you want to be strong against the enemy, get into the word of God. Hide it in your heart and he will give you the strength if you become a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Not like the people of Ezekiel's time where they heard the word, but then they walked away and they did nothing with it. And we're living in the same times, by the way. How many churches are hearing the word on Sunday morning and how many people are walking out and saying, great message, but they never change their lives. They don't become generous people. They don't support the work of God. They're not trusting in Jesus and they're working, working, working for their toys and their joys. Change is what God wants. Let me close. The test in life can become a barometer for our heart. They're a barometer for our heart. Where is your heart today? The Lord wants you to humbly give your heart back to Him. Let Him be your provider. Let Him lead you. Yeah, it might be in deserts and storms, but it's the Lord leading you. And if He's leading you, guess what? He's also going to strengthen you and he's going to get you through. But if you're leading, you don't know what will happen. Possibly destruction. So let him lead you and guide you. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that Jesus passed. And and truly, Lord, we depend upon his righteousness and his approval and not on our own, Lord. We give you glory, honor, and praise, Lord. And now also, Lord, before we leave, we're praying, Lord, that you help us to change help us to be generous people lord help us to realize that it's not our work that provides for us it's not our skills lord it's not our authority lord it's not even our the fact that we are sons of god but lord it's you that provides for us lord you and you alone and so knowing that lord let us be generous people let us prioritize our lives let us not work harder and harder for our toys and joys lord but let us work for our necessities that we may be able to be free to serve you even more lord in your ministry and in your kingdom and it's in jesus name we pray this amen
bless you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>